Hey everyone, welcome to the Get Your Life Together Girl podcast. I'm your host, Danielle Van. As a cognitive behavioral therapist, life coach to women, and author, I've spent my life studying and learning from the stories that make us human. It's my passion and goal to help you shift your mindset and create a lifelong revolution to help you reach your greatest potential. There's one thing I know with complete certainty, and that's the fact that each of us was born with a reason and intention we are living our lives. Yet many women struggle with the question, what is my purpose? Most of us know we want to feel happy, love, successful, make a positive impact, and make enough money to be satisfied. But when it comes with the how we make that possible, we can feel confused and lost. What's even more interesting is once we begin to do the work to heal and grow, we often discover that there's a spark within us that's been longing to come to life. And that spark often turns into an idea that can be a full-blown business. This week, we explore your unique and individual purpose and how we can move that into reality. I sat down with attorney, creator, and Team USA runner, Rachel Branke. Rachel takes us on a journey to find our passion and purpose, marries it with the fundamental steps to turn any wish or intention into a business, and we break down how to engage with that passion in a balanced and free of imposter syndrome way. The next hour gives you all of the information to get started and how to thrive. The Get Your Life Together Girl podcast starts right now. All right, I'm so excited to have you today. And I just really wanna know a little bit about you. And today we're gonna have a brilliant conversation about you know, how can we show up as our best selves and create the dreams and visions that we have that maybe we're a little too afraid to step into? I am excited for this. This is one of my favorite topics because I didn't really come into entrepreneurship. Actually, I didn't even know I was going to be an entrepreneur as a kid. And I just always knew that I didn't fit into like the nine to five. And I always wanted to do things for myself. And so I almost think I took it a little bit further (laughs) the other direction. I do a lot of things, right? I try not to lead normally with that. I'm an attorney, but I am. I have I'm licensed in multiple states, have an online firm, but I also have online legal resources and business strategy resources for entrepreneurs, primarily women that want to create their business for themselves. My whole line is create a real business to live your real life. And that's Mm -hmm. always what I've wanted. And it's not always perfect, (laughs) you know, try to go for it, but that's what I strive for every day. I love that. You know, I was really thinking about, you know, the show's all about mindfulness, the tools that we need to show up as our best self. And as I was thinking about this, I thought, you know what? So many women come to me, you know, when they're in their healing process and what naturally occurs is we begin to talk about what life looks like after we get through the healing process. And so many women have so many aspirations and intentions of creating something for themselves where they don't have to have the nine to five. They can be mom, they can live their biggest dreams, but they do not know how. Mm -hmm. Can you help us kind of get into what are our first steps? If we have a dream, we have an intention, what do we need to do? Yeah. It's kind of a difficult question. And maybe if you had asked me this when I first got into entrepreneurship, like 15, 17 years ago, I would have been very mechanical one, two, three, boom, boom, boom. But with obviously also with your subject matter, it also depends on where you're at in your stage of healing and your Mm -hmm. stage of life. And so it's hard for me to kind of give, I can give a little bit of a checklist of like what I run through frequently so that we're achieving that real biz, real life thing. Really, we want to start with how do we envision for this season of life, for this chapter of our healing, our chapter of where we are as a person in our growth, what is it that we actually want? Because who I was when I first started in business is completely different than it is now. I mean, it has that same like under theme and like a fair, you know, of, you know, I want to do it for myself and I want to grow something, but it has ebbed and flowed based on, well, with me, I have five kids. So mm-hmm. as they're, they've, their ages, they're now more self-sufficient. But I think, so that's where you kind of want to start is looking at your season of life and think, what are you interested in and how can you utilize that to achieve whatever you define 
your life situation to be. And I understand that sometimes it's difficult listening to these podcasts and you hear people like me and like yourself, and we're talking from this level, you know, we've been in business for so many years, we've mm-hmm. achieved things and it makes it sound so easy and almost right. right in a way. And so I just want to encourage those listening that it's not a linear path. So I can sit here and give you these three little things that I just gave you, but it's really just making sure you stay focused on those as the seasons change, as you grow as a person, as you learn different things, because you may start off with this idea of, I want to be, let's say completely virtual serving only moms. Well, Mm -hmm. in five years, you could realize that, no, I actually prefer the intimate in-person type of connection. And maybe I want to work with single moms, like, you know, pivoting just a little bit. So Mm -hmm. I just encourage, like, take this little checklist of like, okay, what am I interested in? What does my season of life look like? Almost puzzle pieces, right? And then how can I fit them together to create the whole puzzle vision of what I'm looking for? But just keep in mind that it's a decision when you do these little checklist items. It's not the decision. I think that is the biggest barrier to many people getting into business. They feel like they have to make the decision. They have to stick with it. And if they Mm -hmm. change it at all, it's failure. And actually, no, the really in tune, mature and professional and successful entrepreneurs are those that take these three pieces and they constantly move it around as things change and your seasons grow. Exactly. And we do that in life, right? So we have to give ourselves permission to do that when we are moving into an intentional Mm -hmm. business or entrepreneurship, as you said, you know, I think one of the biggest things too, that I hear is I am afraid. What if I fail? (laughs) I'm sure you hear that too. Do you have some conversation about that, that we can kind of pivot into because, you know, failure And fear are one and the same, to be honest. And when we really struggle to show up, Mm -hmm. you know, we don't get started. Yeah. I think what's interesting, you know, when you were first asking this like 10 seconds ago, my, my instinct was to say, so what if you fail? Right. And I immediately, my brain, even my heart rate got a little quicker because I was thinking (laughs) back to all the different things that I've done when I have failed, you know, when, Mm -hmm. and, and I get it. It's not that simple. Like when I first started in business, I. I, we, I was going through cancer. I was about 20 years old Mm -hmm. and husband was active duty army. And I didn't have really the capability. We didn't have the money or the capabilities for me to really go work outside the home. So I kind of got pushed in this entrepreneurship feeling that I've always had. And it was kind of nice to have that barrier in this. I mean, it wasn't nice at the time, (laughs) I was not happy with the barriers, but I share that to say that, you know, I was kind of thrust into figuring out how to create a business on my terms so that we can get money coming in. But to your point, a whole fear and failure aspect, I couldn't fail at it because we financially needed it, you know? And so for me, I go back to what I said a little bit ago, this I almost asked the trite question of, so what if you fail? Well, for some people that's life breaking, you right. know, you could financially fail. So I share that to say, first of all, If you're looking at those that are successful or whatever you define or believe them to be successful, they've all gone through times in their business where it may have been almost life or death. It may have almost been house and home type of failure. So just know that you're not alone in that. And I think from there is where we can get a little bit more mechanical. I'm very much when I start to fear or start having the feeling of fear, or I start seeing potential for failure is where I get more into the strategy aspect, the more into, okay, how can I very mechanically implement? Now you don't want to swing the pendulum so far that you get so stuck in the mechanics of business that you don't recognize, you know, maybe causing you anxiety and that's coming out in other ways, but which I have a tendency to do that. If I, my team actually, they'll notice when I'm starting to have like an uptick of anxiety of maybe like we've just launched a new offering or I'm having a really big client and they'll notice that I'll get busy with busy work. When you feel fear, I feel like you can have action items that will drive the business forward. So it helps to get you away from whatever it is that you're fearing and help to reduce the fear a little bit, but don't swing it so far that it's almost as busy work, right? It's like when you know you have things to do around the house or something's bothering you, I'm a stress cleaner. And so I'll go and like purge the closets. Well, that's not really driving me forward at all. So just look at it kind of from that standpoint of I can be mechanical. I can do things that are going to drive me forward, get me away from fear and closer to the success line, 
but don't do it in such a way. And I share this uh, as me. I see this as myself. I see this in my clients that I, the business clients that I work with, that we sometimes will believe that busyness is business. And that is where you'll end up failing. I do the same. You know, as you're talking, I was like, oh, that's totally me. And I know <laughs> it, right? And I'll recognize it. And I'm like, get out of this. Like, what are you doing that's driving you forward? Just like you said, there was something that you said that was really interesting and something that, I think really speaks to all women that listen to this podcast is that you said, you know, I was going through cancer mm -hmm. and I didn't really have the opportunity to fail at this. And a lot of times we'll use our life circumstances as our excuse, mm -hmm. you know, for you to say, well, here is the situation. I had a deployed husband. There were kids. I had cancer. How did you shift your mindset into there is no failure? I don't think it was an intentional mindset. Mm -hmm. I think it was just looking at the circumstances of going, what are my alternatives? You right. know, what really, cause it, I mean, we just did the numbers. It's like doing your budget, putting it together. Just, it just, I could not with the cancer treatments and the financial aspect, we were going to be more in the negative if I went to go work outside the home. Mm -hmm. And so it was almost in many women, especially we saw this during pandemic, we're on the heels of, you know, a couple of years of this COVID stuff. A lot right. of women had to make that same kind of decision. What are we going to do? Look at the finances. So, you know, to me, you know, that was 17 years ago, that baby that I had then is now like a, <laughs> a whole head taller than me. I, so I didn't really make the intentional. I always say when I'm thinking about that portion of my life, you never know what you can do until it's sink or swim time. Mm -hmm. Now get in a situation where it was not so dire, you know, to your point of how do you shift your mindset? I think it's almost like exercising a muscle. So I compete with Team USA for triathlons and it's just like training for any, you know, a triathlon or a marathon or 5k or anything, whatever it is that you're going to do, you don't just get up out of bed and go and run the whole distance. You're going right. to have to every day exercise it and stretch it and grow it and feed it and nurture it. And so, and this actually could go back to what we were saying earlier about the fear aspect every day of just for me, at least, you know, if I start to feel fear, I start seeing that anxiety, or I'm just trying to get into like a new business project that I'm like, oh, I'm not sure this is going to work. It's shifting that mindset and every day, setting the intention to say to myself, what are the positives that could come of this? What is also the worst that could absolutely happen if I fail? Now, I'm privileged to be able to say that at this point. I wouldn't have been able to have that intentional type of discussion with myself back when I was having the cancer, because the alternative would have been, if I fail at this, my family doesn't have money, you know? So I think that's, you know, circling back around to where we started this whole conversation, how you adapt what I just said is going to make a difference depending on where you're at in life. But I think that no matter where level, and I've been through some traumatic things in the last few years. So I understand the whole healing growth and aspect still even through that, I adapted the same thing, exercising the intention and focus every day. And if you want to look at it from more of a mechanical perspective, it's kind of like every day when you sit down to do your business, you want to do something that's going to drive it forward. So a mm -hmm. revenue generating activity in RGA. And I think of the same thing for mindset, what is going to move me closer for this to becoming habit, to have the stamina, to have this mindset, it's that everyday exercise, stretching and growing. Absolutely brilliant. Of course, you know, it sounds easy, but it's not that easy. <laughs> well, it is anything right? Nothing really is until we put the focus and intention into it to do the work. And that's when it becomes easy because it becomes a habit. Yes. Right. And so that's where we fall into that place. And you know what? I, it's so not lost on me that so many athletes do yes. have that men, that mental mentality of I'm seeing it as the race. I'm getting on the block. I'm taking off. I'm taking step by step, you know, and we move through that piece like that. It's not lost on me at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could even take it a step further. You know, when you're on the back half of marathon, mm -hmm. you tell yourself live in the suffering because you can't, I mean, what's your choice? You give up and it ends. Right. And then you've got your whole emotions of not finishing the race. You've got to live and work with the suffering. And so the majority of athletes that I have been in contact with, when I say that though, they're not like the whole time. Oh my gosh, I hate this. They go, okay, I'm in the suffering. It's exactly what we were just talking about. Intentionality. What are the positive of this? Okay. Only seven miles to go. Okay. Right. My hips feel good. It's like focusing on the good things. Uh, again, easier said than done. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. As a runner myself, I feel that 
<laughs> completely. <laughs> you know, I think that one of the other pieces of this is I just really don't know how, like I have the idea. I am scared as hell, but I'm going to do it anyway. Mm-hmm. Now, what do I do? How do I do it? And the other thing too, is that sort of imposter syndrome of seeing someone on social media and they're like, okay, this is how they do it. And I'm going to do it the same way. And then they don't get the results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, and I can give you guys the kind of the formula that I always use to start in moving into this. But before we get into that, I just, so when I first started in business, this was before the days of Facebook, of Mm -hmm. Instagram, Pinterest, blogging was really only like personal blogging. So if you, podcasting wasn't nearly what it is. So if you wanted knowledge about business, you had to do, this can make me sound really old. (laughs) Um, There was my space, so I'm not that old, but. We're the same age, my dear, it's fine. (laughs) (laughs) But to learn business wise, you either had to go out in your community and find Mm -hmm. business people that were willing to be a mentor or like in the context of how we have all these business courses and such online and resources, you would have to go down to a conference center, you know, go in these big hotel conference rooms, sit and listen to this whole seminar and that kind of stuff. So during that time, again, I didn't have the finances. I didn't have the know-how. No one in my family had created a business. And so I was just kind of piecing it together from what I could find on the internet at the time. I think that was good in its own way. Mm -hmm. Now we're at the other end of it. There's so much information and it actually feeds into exactly what you just said. You know, you log on Instagram, you can hit a business owner just by touching one hashtag, you can hit hundreds of them. Right. And so you you have so much information at your fingertip that it is almost working against us. And then it also leads in the imposter syndrome. So here's what I always do. And, you know, I already mentioned earlier, the whole definition of, you know, define what your real business looks like. Well, first start with your real life, right? What does mm-hmm. this chapter of your life look like for you? You know, what could you do as a business to achieve it? And then define the real business. The next step is really also what is a formula for every decision I make in business, including what are the next steps? Who am I going to learn from? How do I stay focused? And I think one of the things with imposter syndrome is that it's really, and I'm this way, I'm 17 years into business. I have multiple businesses. I have team members and I feel like I've done really well, but I still some days will get distracted and look at other people and I start going, Oh, if I could do that, but here I always recenter myself with this formula. Who is it you're very specifically trying to serve? I call it the client avatar. Again, showing my age back when we had (laughs) avatars on message boards. (laughs) I love it. You know, so that plus what is your unique serving position? How Mm. are you going to serve those people very uniquely? You know, because again, there's so many people in so many different industries right now. You and this is where I get into, I start looking around, I'm going, oh my gosh, there's millions of people already doing that. So the question is, how do I uniquely do that differently? So for Mm -hmm. example, I'm an attorney and I do business stuff, copyright and trademarks. That's pretty general. There's thousands upon thousands of attorneys doing that. The way that I have flipped the unique serving position is that I get very specific to who I'm talking to. So like one of my brands is very specific to photographers. And then my unique serving position is that I am almost like the mom next door. I'm not this lawyer on a pedestal talking to you. I have been a photographer. I was a photographer through law school to help pay for it. And so I know what you're going through. So I'm not leading with what I'm just, I'm serving the legal advice. It's kind of how I'm serving that to them and how I'm connecting. So Mm -hmm. client avatar plus unique serving position, and then also a consistent content runway. Those are really the three major factors. So whenever I look at any decision I'm going to make in business, coming on this podcast or creating a new project or a new offering, we run it through that lens. And that's the foundation of marketing and everything. So I bring that around to say, in the context of imposter syndrome, if you start looking at someone else and you're going, oh my gosh, I want that success. Do they fit those three buckets? At least the first two. Are they Mm -hmm. also trying to meet the needs of the avatar that you are? Are they also doing the exact same serving position as you? This is kind of a trick question because nobody can ever be you. 
So that, that, the answer is automatically no. And so that should be a good way. And, you know, and taking it a step back too, and I know it's difficult, especially if you're in like the beginning stage, like I was, where financially dependent needed it to happen. And we saw this with pandemic, women forced to leave jobs. And this was the, and I keep bringing this up because working as a business strategist, I worked with a lot of women who were forced to leave their jobs due to childcare during pandemic and try to start their new businesses. And they were very much, afraid. They were very much unsure what to do. We ran through this formula. Who are you going to serve? What is your unique position? And then if you start feeling panicked, just take a step back and only take pieces, utilize those people that you're watching around you and try to look at it from a more um, research standpoint and a less emotive standpoint. So you go, okay, I see what Jenny's doing. We may be serving the same avatar. Our unique serving positions are similar. So instead of going, oh, Jenny is already corner of the market and I don't mm-hmm. use and then my fear spiral starts happening. Stop yourself again, exercising that muscle and go, okay, what are the top three things that I'm attracted to that Jenny's doing and see mm-hmm. if those fit into your formula. And if they would fit into your serving position in the market, if they don't, you, you know, you can have your wallowing moment of, oh my goodness, a fear, but I think it's very much, okay, that doesn't work for me next, but it's easy when you're just scrolling through Instagram and you're that quick view that triggers the imposter syndrome, but working through it like this is how I do. And I also work with my clients of, okay, let's take this from an emotional reaction and let's utilize it for research. That's going to move our business forward. And the other part of that too, is that we discount how much other people are going to connect with us that yeah. may not connect with them. Yep. That's a huge thing. We forget that not everyone is going to resonate with every single person. So even if they have you know, a very successful business, or they have a huge platform that they have really shown up for, you have the ability to connect with someone who cannot connect with them. Yep. Yep. I love that you brought this up actually, because the example I gave with the legal website for photographers, one of the ways that I really try to separate myself is being, I mean, a creative like them. And mm-hmm. cause I am, so I'll, I have a nose ring, I wear ripped jeans. So if you think of contracts lawyer, you're not thinking ripped jeans and nose ring. Right. I cannot tell you how many nasty comments I get primarily from men, but I'm not looking to right. serve men. Although I do, I have a lot of wonderful men in my audience, but my avatar is women, you know, school age children, pretty much. They're basically me just <laughs> needing yeah. my help. And so it attracts them. And it's, but so I almost like when I first started doing this, I was like, oh my gosh, no one's going to like me if I'm authentic like this. And if I'm going to do this and mm-hmm. do that. And I have just seen over the years, it helps to drop off those. And guess what? There's another lawyer that can serve them and they will be happier down there. I would rather on the very front end, see the red flags, see that we're not for each other. I want to see that that client's not for me and I'm not for them right off the bat. Right. And, you know, with that too, going with this formula, it's creating yourself to be the go-to person so mm-hmm. that when someone is standing at like a networking event and they go, oh, I'm starting a photography business, but I don't know the legal stuff. Boom, Rachel Branke, right? right? Like that's the way you want to work towards. And if you're, and, and I made this mistake and I actually... Well, I guess I could share it. So when I first started out in business, I did very general because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I think sometimes you're just not sure. Maybe, you know, you want to work with business owners. You want to work with moms, but you don't really know what that looks like. That's okay. Cast the net wide, stay in tune with what naturally comes out, see who you attract, see what you want to serve, and then narrow it down. I actually, even during pandemic, tried to go broader on one of my projects and it didn't work as well. Being very narrowly, almost terrifyingly niche so that you are the go-to is one of the best ways to penetrate the market. And quite frankly, it makes it easier for every decision that you're going to make in your business. Could you go back to that formula that we just talked about avatar, unique serving position. You're not having to like fish all over the lake. You're staying in one spot and going deep. And I'm all about analogies. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> but, it but that's the way that I visualize it. Yeah. And that just helps me to stay focused too. When I start getting imposter syndrome creeps in, it's like, oh, I must start offering all the things. And it's like, no, you're going to be more successful serving the people that you have here in this area of your lake, fish mm-hmm. deep down and, you know, and keep offering to them versus, you know, like with fishing, you move around all the time. You're going to miss out back to your question a couple of minutes ago, where we started was how do I move into the next step, utilize this formula, you know, partner with what we talked about earlier. And then 
I know this is this is like the worst. This is like a lawyer answer. You just have to test it because it just depends. And I just think that if you give yourself a sufficient time period, this is another mistake I have a tendency even now to make. I'll get excited about a new offering. It may fit within that avatar. It may fit in our serving position. But then all of a sudden, I'm like, within five days, I'm like, why don't we have nibbles? Why don't we have bites? What's right. going on? Panic, 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 you know, abort, abort. Mm -hmm. And you have to give it. And then so back to that third piece I was mentioning was like a consistent runway. You have to give the stuff time to work, you know, no matter what it is you're doing. So if you're brand new, if you're listening to this and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed. Okay. Let's recenter here. Who, you know, where are you at in your life situation? What are you interested in? Who do you want to serve and how can you do it differently? Those are mm -hmm. the like, what's that? Four or five key yes. things and really make a plan to implement that and let it run with a good content runway. When I say content runway, it's however you're going to show up, wherever your people are, Instagram, YouTube, podcasts, and give it a good 30, 45, 60 days. If you can, I know that's difficult if you're financially dependent upon these actions, but you got to give it time because every time that you panic pivot, you're starting over from, you're going back to the start line, back to the race analogy. Mm -hmm. You know, you're running a little bit, you stop, you're having to go back to the start line. You're not getting any closer to the next step. I love that, that you just said that, because that is something that is life-changing across all levels of life, mm -hmm. whether we're doing healing work or wellness or growth or business, whatever it is, is we want that instant gratification. We want the instant results and what is worth having takes time. And we really get scared, right? Like, oh, nobody, you know, downloaded my offer. And so then we start pulsing all the people that we know, like, can you do this? Will you share this? Can you be a part of that? And everybody's like, look, I have my own thing going on. I don't have time to do that for you. You know, do you find that even within your own clients that that fear of right mm -hmm. now creeps in hard. Yeah. One of the things it's like, I'm raising my hand because I was doing that this week and my team was like, no, we yeah. committed. What I like to do is when I'm going to release a new offering, if I've done all the work, right. If I'm going to also going back to that flexing of the muscle, you know, training that muscle before I even release the offering, it's making a commitment. Now it's a little easier now that I have a team that keeps me accountable, but when it was just right. me, it's making that commitment to say, I'm going to give this 45 days, 45 days of hundred percent effort, because I want to be able in 45 days to be able to say I gave hundred percent instead of going, Oh, maybe I should have just done that a little bit more, this little bit more right. help to reduce the ambiguities off of it. And I, I get it again. I'm not trying to sound like I'm unsympathetic to those who are like, I got to get this going. I got to get this going. But the reality is the the push of that feeling of I got to get this going can be channeled for good, but it's not going to make that time period go any quicker. It, mm -hmm. It's just the nature of business. You got to have touch points. You got to have that content runway. You've got to be, you know, talking very specifically to who you are with your unique position and you have to give it time, which is unfortunate, you know, but again, yeah. I'm impatient. I'm the same way. So like for our most recent one, we changed up our offering a little bit and the pricing and I, we made a commitment as a team. We said, okay, we're going to give it 30 days. And then we're going to look at like adjusting just the copy after 30 days, not mm -hmm. completely ripping apart the whole unless we get like horrible feedback, right. From, from purchasers or from people when we survey them with 30 days. So a timeline intention and what specifically you're going to reassess after 30 days, yeah, or whatever your time period is. I want to go a little deeper for just a moment, because if you are at the starting point, you hear the word avatar or, you know, niche down and everybody's head starts to explode. What do you mean by that? And really what you're saying is who is that ideal person, right? And you can go really deep with that. They are the mom that is between 25 and 44 or whatever. Can you talk a little bit about that? So avatar, I do this kind of like a visualization exercise. And it's, if they were to walk into my office and sit down across from me, who is it that I would be so excited to serve? Who do I mm -hmm. want to walk in that door? And it's not just the demographics, right? That's a one portion of this um, or marital status or parental status. That is elements because those are kind of like the connectors that you use. Like, for example, me, I have five kids. I'm very relaxed. I'm a creative. I love coffee. So those are like connective things that are superficial. They're like at the tip of the iceberg, I guess, if you will, to, to the person I want to reach, but even more so you go deeper into what do they want? Like if you're serving other business owners, what do they want in their real business mm -hmm. in real life? Or maybe if you're serving moms and it has something to do with like 
being a better mother or relationship or I shouldn't have said the term better mother. I don't believe there's such thing as that, but I'm just trying to encapsulate something mm-hmm. that you could do business to consumer. Maybe you're providing them tips for better organization, et cetera. You want to know what drives them as well. So your avatar, you've got the demographics aspect of like what they look like, what they're interested in, what their preferences are, where do they shop? What are they into? Because again, that's how you're going to connect with them from a superficial level, but then being able to serve them on a deeper level. What is it that they need? What are their pain? pain points or Mm -hmm. what is it something that they're seeking is a community, which could also be a pain point. Maybe they feel alone. You know, what is the pain point and what is your solution going to be for that? So your avatar is, and you know, what's funny, you can go and Google it after we're done with this podcast. And those that are listening, you're going to find all sorts of worksheets, right? Create however you want it to be right. You know, I think the biggest thing for me is boiling down to just, it's almost a feeling Like I can visualize that person walking in and sitting in front of me and off the top of my head, I can write down the top things that I know we'll end up talking about or what I want her to come to me for. And that kind of helps to really guide. So don't get so bogged down and feeling like, oh, it's like business school. We got to do a whole matrix and all this sort of stuff. You can, if that's your type of approach. And I'm that way. Sometimes it helps me to get focused, but So avatar is the defining of the person, who they are, what they're seeking. And then your serving position is just what solution do you have to whatever problem or need that avatar is? And how can you do it differently than anyone else on the market is doing? Mm. You have used the word focus multiple times and it is something, and I love that I use focus too, right? I always say, are you focusing on what's important? What is the important piece of this? Are you being intentional? Which is really focus. We live in a society of extreme distraction. Mm -hmm. We live in a world and maybe even a household of crazy. (laughs) So (laughs) yes, you're right. I know as a mom of three, it's crazy. I can imagine how a mom of five is, (laughs) you know, and running businesses and showing up. It's hard. It is distracting. Focus is sometimes a big issue, even for the most mindful person. How do you stay focused in your intentionality to show up in your businesses? So I, this is something that I have fine tuned over the years. So the answer might change in five years if we do Mm -hmm. this podcast again, but some of the common themes throughout the years has been trying to schedule all that I can. So I have my calendar set up very specifically that I do certain things on certain days. Well, let me back up for a second. I make sure to put my family and personal commitments and desires into my calendar first, Mm -hmm. because it's that whole real business, real life thing. And so I want to make sure that, because I've done this before, you just said it, we get very distracted and it's so easy, especially when you're in like the beginning stages of business, or you're just setting up like a new offering or product. And you're just like, go, 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 go. Some of it's a little panic driven. It's really easy for you to put your head down, get all distracted and not intentional. And you're not moving the needle forward when you do that. You're becoming very ineffective to most people, yourself, to mm-hmm. your family or whoever is around you. Um, when I say family, it doesn't have to be blood, just whoever, my best friend, my family. So mm-hmm. your family and also those who you're looking to serve. So for me, I always try to, we go back to the real business, real life definition. I carve out my calendar in a way that allows for the personal stuff to go in first. Then we put the business stuff and then getting even more granular. Let's say in my block of time, I'm doing content creation. So maybe I'm sitting down to get my content runway planned out and create the content. I'm going to look, especially since I have such limited time, I'm going to look at what is going to. So with the formula we talked about earlier, avatar plus unique serving position in the content runway, how can I create like one piece of content that can be repurposed in multiple ways so that I'm mm-hmm. maximizing the time. And, and so that's kind of the way that I look at it. Cause I know I'm not going to get through that to-do list of 20 items. And so right. I need to prioritize what's going to give me my bit biggest bang for my buck. I almost always try to look at every action that I do. I want at least three returns from it. Now, this isn't a hard formula. Sometimes there's opportunities that come up. They're just, you know, they're, they feel me as a person, or they're just fun to do, or they're a favor for a friend. But for the most part, all actions I take in business for every one action, I want at least three returns. And Mm -hmm. so let's take like this podcast, for example, I commit to doing it. 
I love doing it. So that's also one return. That's something intrinsically that I much enjoy. The other return is that hopefully those listening will feel impact and they will want to come see what I'm doing and maybe, you know, either consume my free resources. We have paid resources later, but then like the third return is that being on another podcast provides me some authority and credibility, but then like, you know, so that's three returns out of this one action. And there's even more, right. There's going to be residuals that I don't know that I can create an impact on someone who may never reach out to me. And so But yeah, so every action that I take, and I think what is important with all of this, we can, you can walk through this whole process I just shared, but the only way that it really works and the only way that you're really going to drive your business forward besides consistency is at the end of the day, what doesn't get done, doesn't get done and the Mm. earth does not Mm -hmm. explode. Oh, I wish everyone could just stop and pause in that for just a moment. I am guilty of that myself. I will. Yeah, I'll make that list and it's long. And of course, my hands are in so many different things and I look at my schedule and I can get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, what is the most important thing today? And that's what's so important today not tomorrow, not next week, not five years from now, but today and being really intentional about your time in the day. You can always roll that list over. Yep. And it's hard because I just remember, and I fall into this sometimes too, it's that anxiety coming up and being totally transparent with this mm-hmm. stuff. But it's, especially when you're the leader of the business and there's a bit right. more stress that may be attached, or even like in the beginning when it was this big monkey on my back, I've got to make money. It's easy to also convince yourself, oh, this is for the good of the business, right? Um, You know, I'm going to work late and I did work later last night, but that's because I took off midday. So it's a give and take, right? You have to define it how you want to be and set your own boundaries. It's funny you bring this up because I am still learning to do this even 17 years into business, but I just recently did a presentation to a local realtor organization and they wanted to know about burnout and like the top events in my life that have Mm -hmm. changed me. And as I was preparing for it, and as I was giving it, I realized the five times that I talked about were ones where exactly this, where I allowed either imposter syndrome, I allowed panic, I allowed that to-do list to control me, that I pushed my own self to burnout. It was like that whole, you know, even where we started this whole conversation of recognizing where you're at in your season of life, that Mm -hmm. might've been a throwaway line for some listening. And I want you to intentionally come back around to that because these five events that I spoke on and I look at in my life where I was justifying that it was for the business, that I was driven by panic or fear. It was situations where I was finding that my business was not growing as well because of that, Mm -hmm. it was, I wasn't setting the boundaries. I was getting burnout. It was interrupting and interfering with my personal relationships. It was simply because I had my head to the grindstone. And this is why I totally nix this whole hustle culture aspect. I think it's important when you have certain days a week, you do certain tasks. When you, when I sit down to content create, I am on it, right? I am like, let's get this done. That's the hustle I'm talking about. I'm not talking this 24 seven, got to do all the opportunities that come your way. Got to do all the things at the expense of everything else. I think that with that, it's my head was down. Take pandemic, for example. Prior to pandemic, kids were in school. I had this fairly interrupted time during the day. I could do the work I needed to do. My schedule was what it was. If I had not been like, oh gosh, I can't keep doing all this during the day. I mean, I got thrust into it. I was like, oh my gosh, five kids, virtual learning from home. What am I going to do? But it all the moments that were the most frustration that led to burnout. And I see this with my business consulting clients as well. When they start feeling burnout, I'm like, is your head down and you've not popped it up to look to see as your season of life change because Mm -hmm. all these things that you learn, you may listen to this podcast here now, what are we 2022? The season of life that you're in now is probably going to be completely different than what you're going to be in 2024. When you listen to this, the principles that we talk about are the same, but you listening are going to apply it differently. And it's just being vigilant and mindful of that. Again, raising my hand, I can count at least five major events in my life where I allowed that fear and panic, imposter syndrome drove me. And I kept justifying it. It's for Mm -hmm. the business. It's for the good. It's for growing the business. And actually 
you can't dispute data. I go back and look at my financial numbers. I had slower growth during those time periods. Why? Because I was ineffective to everyone. I was not an effective thought leader. I was not an effective. I wasn't connecting the way I could be. It all comes across. So anyways, I say all that to say, I've given you this structure of like, you know, put your life stuff in first, then put your business stuff, schedule it. What are the priority activities? Again, all through the lens we talked about of who do we want to serve and how are we uniquely going to do it and do it consistently, but don't do it at the expense and don't justify to yourself that, you know, and I do think there's some sweat equity when you're building a business or right. launching a new offering, but I don't think it needs to be to the extreme. It's hard. I think when we're sitting in it to see that we're extreme. Yeah. And that was going to be my next question is how do we avoid the pitfalls? But you really went through that. And I can say the same, you know, Mm -hmm. in building different businesses and showing up in different ways. When I put my head down, there's such a block and blinder Mm -hmm. on that. When I come back up, I go, oh, wait, hold on. Did I inadvertently affect everybody around me? And have I taken care of myself and my mental health as well? And to the point that you're making, when you disconnect from your life that way, what you also do is you really deregulate your emotions. And we create this situation where we have emotional exhaustion, physical, mental, spiritual, Mm -hmm. and we can't get ourselves out of it very easily. And then we think my business is failing. My relationship is failing. My children are not where they need to be if you're a mom. Um, And we start looking around and think, this wasn't worth it. Mm -hmm. But what we've done is we've really put the blinders on instead of showing up. Yeah, I love that you've said that because it kind of goes back to, I kind of touched on a little bit earlier. When clients come to me and they're like, I am so burnt out. It's either one of two things. Mm -hmm. Well, generally, it's either one, they have the blinders on. And they almost just need permission, even though Mm -hmm. we don't need it. Do you know what I mean? Yes. You almost need permission to pick your head up, scale back, adjust things, or two, maybe that's just, you know, and this goes back to what you asked about before, you know, how do you get into this? How do you decide what you want to do? It's just a decision. It's not the decision. And many entrepreneurs get into it and feel like, oh, I said, I'm going to serve this person. I said, this could be my unique position. This is my product. I got to make this happen. And the reality is you're going to ebb and flow. You're going to change. You're not, I'm not the same person I was 17 years ago and your offerings are going to change. The market is going to change. And so, yeah, the burnout either comes from your blinders are on and you've put yourself and you just outlined all the things that has the ripple effect on, or you're just, you just need to give yourself permission to pivot or simply give up entrepreneurship. And that is okay too. I know many business owners who they are, were drawn into this entrepreneurship business aspect because they wanted the flexibility or because they had to, like with pandemic. And then they realized they didn't love the strategy. They don't love looking at KPIs the way that I do, key performance right. indicators. They don't love doing all like that grunt work. They just want to be able to like create content, for example. Well, guess what? It's not a failure to go, I don't want to be a business owner go and work for someone else. In fact, my right hand at my, my main business, she would, is a, she has her own side business, but she's a stellar business owner, but she doesn't want all of that stuff. So I do all that right. stuff and she gets to do the fun stuff. So now I'm going, <laughs> wait, who got the right part of the deal here? Uh, <laughs> But, there, but you know, so it's either one side you're, you have the blinders on, you got to get them off, or it is going to be very disastrously effective on you. And I have, I could share stories about how I ended up with like postpartum and mental health issues and all that arising out of one of these moments of being burnt out and not taking the blinders off or the mm-hmm. other side, simply you just need permission to either change within your business or get out of being in business. That is okay too. And you know what? I, (laughs) this is going to sound kind of weird. When I work with business clients who feel this burnout, we go through this whole exercise of which path are you on? If they come to the determination that business is not, is just not for them. I actually get so incredibly excited that they had this self-awareness and recognize this now, because I know the detrimental effects of trying to power through something, the ripple effect it can have. And honestly, as much as I love business, this is just business. And I know it's a little difficult when you're financially you know, dependent upon right. it, but business should be a supporting actor to your life. It shouldn't be something that you have to necessarily do. Now I feel that way when I pay taxes and I'm doing all that yucky stuff, <laughs> right? But, but you know, like I just, I get so excited when I see people 
on the burnout because this isn't for them side go, you know what, I just don't want to be a business owner. And that's the right decision for them. But I also get excited for those that are like, okay, my blinders are off. How do I fix this? Let me get that three to one rule, Rachel, like you were talking about. How can I take one action, get three returns, get more efficient, you know, adjust to my circumstances. And that's, and and, and I'll tell you what, it's very difficult. And it's easy for us to sit here and say this. And it's easier when you have like a business consultant who's on the outside looking in, it's always easier when you're not on the inside. Right. But it's taken me 17 years of even trying to clean these sort of for myself, you know, you and I both mentioned it earlier, you know, busyness, you know, I start doing, I start revamping the website that doesn't need it just because I'm trying to channel my anxiety. So having the awareness to catch that will keep me from putting those blinders on and getting to burnout. Mm -hmm. That's a very important part. The other part too, is like you just said, you know, being aware of what's happening within, and that is of course for everything. But when we are in these moments of, we are trying to make something happen, we have to realize that we are stimulating that emotional body. Mm -hmm. And if we're not focused in a really healthy way, we are going to get into a place where anxiety is ruling every decision. And like you said, it's not going to grow. It's not going to create the outcome in which you are trying to get to, Mm -hmm. which brings me to the point of what are, and this may be again, very mechanical, but what are some of the biggest no-nos that we see people do when they are trying to make things happen? I mean, I, I think it's mistaking it's almost, it's like we kind of said it already, justifying that anxiety or justifying mm-hmm. having to do all the things and complete that to-do list every day in the name of business, quote unquote, in the name of hustle, because that's what the, that's what keeping up with the Joneses, you know, right. teaches you got to hustle, got to hustle. I think it's, whether it's an intentional justification or if it's just, and it's, it, this happens very specifically when the fear is setting in, well, I got to do this so I can get money. And mm-hmm. when it's really panic or fear that is driving it, or, well, I'm watching Jenny down the street do X, Y, and Z. I got to do X, Y, and Z. I think that is what getting distracted with that and being run by fear. Well, no matter what your fear is, and I haven't like attached this fear very specifically to anything I've kind of thrown out sometimes fear of failure, fear of money, but your fear could be fear of rejection. It could be fear (laughs) of anything. So listening, whatever your fear may be, it's being in tune and attentive with that and catching it and not trying to justify it. Cause you know, for a long time, I convinced myself that business was for me, which it is, but not in the way that I used to kind of like justify it. I would say that business was my me time, my care time until it wasn't. Right. And it was one of those big burnout moments that I finally realized that because that wasn't business wasn't meeting me where I needed to be. Right. It wasn't feeding me spiritually in the way that I needed to grow as a person. And I think that's another thing that's not talked a lot about. And this is what I love about your podcast that I don't think the, we talk very, and I do this too on my own podcast. Sometimes, you know, I'm very mechanical, do this for business, do this for that. Here's the checklist for this, blah, blah, blah. But all of that means nothing. If you aren't growing as a person and yes. you're going to grow byproduct of your circumstances around you. But I'm talking about like the intentional growth that has to happen. Um, I especially have seen this when I shifted from being just myself with one business to getting team members to now having managers that manage people that manage people. And it that has its own host of issues. And I started seeing issues pop up and it didn't have to do with the business. It didn't necessarily have to do with my standard operating procedures. It didn't have to do with the KPIs or the amount of revenue that was coming in. It had to do with how I was Mm -hmm. in interpersonal conversations and connections, which also was rooted in my emotions and my life circumstances. But to all that to say, I I remember moments. And if my team is listening to this, I love you guys for the grace (laughs) that you give me. I'm still growing, but... I notice that when I am, I don't want to say in, in, 
deficient. What is the word I'm looking for? I keep catching myself because I'll say something and then my therapist will be like, we don't target that we don't, way. We don't you're talk that a, way, my you're dear. Not a, <laughs> you're not a deficient person. If I'm not fulfilling my max capacity in a specific emotional mm-hmm. state that I should, is that better? <laughs> then I can see the negative implications of that. In fact, right. one of the things, because of the way that my, I always, I'm fighting the patterns of this very mechanical side of me. One thing that I would encourage, oh, this is good. I didn't even think about this earlier. If you're just getting into business, but especially if you're somebody that's looking at hiring team members to help you and you're going to be a manager, take the Clifton Strengths assessment test. Mm-hmm. Now, but you're going to look at the results differently. And I think most people will tell you. You can look at the strengths, great, see your superhero traits. But what I think is most important, what Clifton shows is the blind spots. Right. So while I could be championed for being quick finger, fast pace, critical thinking, all of that, my blind spot is not all my team members are, and it can have a ripple effect of making them feel um, not good enough, right? That Mm -hmm. they can't keep up when it had nothing to do with their skill set or their output, but it's just what I thought would be as a positive as a leader actually has a blind spot could be a negative. And so I I highly recommend anyone to, and you don't have to like hang your hat on just those results, but for someone like me, if you're sitting there going, well, I don't know what my blind spots are. I've got my blinders on. What's the deal. That was really illuminating for me. It's so important too to understand that doesn't matter where you are, whether you're starting a business, you have team members, you are going to be moving into that into the future is that you possibly cannot know everything at all times. Mm -hmm. And so if you know that about yourself, you must give the same grace to the other people around you. We hire people to help us, or we, you know, pulse our friends or our community, or even the people that are doing it, you know, that we see on social media, because you think they know more than you do, or they have a different skill set than you do. So we have to keep in mind that we all have our own strengths, our own downfalls, and that we bring people around us to help us meet our needs so that we can do our best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, one thing that came up while you were just talking was, I think there's this idea that when you first start out, oh, when I make my first hundred K, I'll have the business knowledge I need it'll be easier. I'll be so sophisticated. And then you think about that, about your 500 K about your million, but I'll tell you what, why I shared that formula earlier, we go around to it all the time. We're a multimillion dollar revenue business. And every time when I either start getting panicked, (laughs) the anxiety starts coming up or we will go, okay, hold on. Let's recenter here. Go back to real business, real life definition. And then the client avatar USP And that almost always gets us back on the path of way we need to go. So mm-hmm. I share that to say, and hopefully it's comforting for those that may be feeling overwhelmed listening or, you know, just getting ready to start a business or in your first few years, you are going to learn new things. You are going to become a savvier business person, but you never can get away from these classic foundations. They're always going to be there. And that actually should be comforting, you mm-hmm. know, that, so instead of having to feel like there's a bar you have to reach, once you kind of get a grasp on these foundational aspects and just keep fine tuning them, that, it's like, instead of having a big old encyclopedia, you've got a little cliff notes book. Definitely. You know, and this goes back to the whole mindset and reframing of things is once you can get past the whole overwhelm of getting into business, especially if you're sitting here going, I still don't know what I need to do. That's right. okay. Right. Just work through and just be comforted in that no matter what level you get at, you're still always are foundationally going to go back to these pieces. And, you know, other people teach something similar. They may call it different things. Uh, but the common theme is there because it's what you're think of visualize it. You're literally going to lay the blocks with this stuff and you're going to improve them and upgrade them and change them over the years, but they're always going to be the foundation of the business or Mm -hmm. project or offering or whatever it is that you're moving into. And I just feel like that's so freeing to know that there's not this unlimited limit that I have to try to fill of all this knowledge. As long as you just stay focused on this, no matter what stage you're at, it will drive you forward. And it also helps to keep you in check. I mean, like with my three to one rule, I used to fall into, it was kind of, I think it was during the same time period of one of those big burnouts of, I have to take every opportunity that comes my way, even to the detriment of my kids. And they were little at the time. And I regret some of it a lot that you know, I didn't spend as much time with them, can't go back. So I try to, you know, trying to make up for some of that time now, but it was because I was justifying to myself, business is for me, family's got to have it. And I can't, 
heaven forbid I turned on this one opportunity and I'll tell you what I can't remember any opportunities right. from that time period at all now that yeah. shows that they didn't have that great of an impact but because it was presented I felt like I had to take it yeah there's two points that I you know extracted from that and it's something that I know personally were either struggles or something that I focus on so I'm going to hand them both over so I don't forget one is that beginner mindset in anything, no matter how much, you know, yep. for me, at least is such a big winner mindset for me. If I can keep myself in that beginner stage, what more can I learn to apply mm -hmm. and move forward with that? Yeah, I'm, I'm gaining knowledge. Yes. I'm learning more than I ever thought. But when I feel like, well, I know everything I need to know about that. I shut the door on the opportunity. The next piece of that was I was the same way in the beginning of my career. I started as a news anchor, you know, then I was, you know, a young adult novel writer. And then I had my own life crisis and ended up going back to school to, to be where I am now. But there was something that I always thought that because I'm the daughter of entrepreneurs, that if I worked really hard mm. and I showed up all the time. Mm -hmm. that my kids would see me as this badass woman that mm -hmm. marched that also came at the relationship side of things too. Yeah. They need to see you being a badass. They also need you to nurture them and mm -hmm. business can't be all of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's, you know, and, and I think, I hope that those listening here from both of us, like we're sharing these things that we've gone through hopefully that you won't make the same mistakes. But I do think that there's just an element of sometimes you could listen to all the podcasts you want. You can sit at the mm -hmm. feet of people and learn, but you're, there's just, it's just almost like a rite of passage. You're going right. to go through some of this. So like when we're talking, and I said a little bit ago, regret, another word that I'm therapist says I'm not supposed to use. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we won't tell him that I've been saying all the wrong things today. And it's just kind of like with business too. Okay. I took time away from family, which smacked in the face of my whole real business, real life <laughs> motto. Mm -hmm. So what can I do about it now? And for me, it's twofold. It's one, how can I adjust it for myself going forward, but also how is it, how I can help others to avoid going through that. And so right. it's just looking at whatever has happened, almost like a debrief, like when you have a launch or, right. you know, you're at the end of the quarter and you're looking at your key performance indicators, you go, okay, what worked, what didn't work and how can we fix it going forward? I always try to look at, especially failures. I'm not saying that this was a failure. It was a learning lesson, but right. what you want to call failures, I think maybe we should not fear failure as much because as long as you take from it and go, what can I do to help make up for it? Makeup's probably not the right word, but make up for it with me. But also, how can I use this to help others to not make the same mistake or mm -hmm. choice, really? Right. And that goes back to the beginner mindset, mm -hmm. right? Like in the beginning, we don't know all the things. And so we do pulse, but we also tend to take things a little bit slower. We tend to take slower, more intentional actions because mm -hmm. we know that we don't know everything. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's, you know, it's actually a benefit, you know, what can you do to slow down just a little bit? I have to know if there was one thing that, or it could be multiple things really that you wished women knew when starting out on say a passion project or deciding that they're going to get into business, what would those things be? Oh man. That's a lot a of ask. what we just talked about, I think, right. I think, I think the big thing is I wish they knew what they were going to learn about themselves, mm. which is so exciting. I think when you get into yeah. business, especially if you're one, like I was in the beginning, I mean, I always had an entrepreneurial mindset feeling, but was thrust into it for finances. It's very much again, like blinders, very much focused on got to reach hundred K got to reach selling this to amount, many amount of people. I just wish women knew what, how you were going to grow and learn in ways that you never really thought about mm -hmm. and to be excited for that and to be, you know, beginner's mind, right. To be open for how that's going to come. I think, you know, and we've even talked about it here, but I feel like with the barrage of business podcasts out there and resources, it's really easy. And we've said the word a couple of times, mechanical, it's very easy to get distracted and go, Oh, I've got to get into the mechanics of business. I got, I got the checklist. Right. I got to do, and I get it. I sell legal checklists. I sell all that sort of stuff. I right. get it. 
you have to have an element of that, but it's learning through the process. Like how do you best learn? You don't know what type of leader you'll become. You may recognize strengths that you never knew you had before becoming a very, you know, maybe you're more empathetic than you realized, or, you know, just being open to that is so exciting. And I feel like business is such a good way for that to be revealed, especially because you're the one making the intentional steps. I know we have intentionality in all of our lives and personal, well, for the most part, like in what we do, we have choice over that, but business, I feel like we have even like an enhanced choice, Mm -hmm. like living, we live, whereas business, I wake up, I'm alive, right? Right. (laughs) Business, I make the intentional choice to go engage in the business activities and we're captain of that ship. And it just, that's just so exciting. Right. You know, that made me think about what I do every day and what I always encourage other women to do, whether they're sitting with me in session or just my friends. And also just looking at the women that are in my life. It is when we engage in the things that make us fired up, that our passion, those things that can continue to sort of ruminate in our head in a positive way. Those are the pieces that we tend to be able to move into big businesses, into pieces that really do serve. Like you were talking about that three pillar is that if we feel passion about it, usually it's connected to our purpose. Yeah. Yes. You as long as it's passion and not anxiety driven. <laughs> <laughs> right. Know the difference, please. Right. Like if your hands are shaking, that's anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> or it could be the adrenaline from being so passionate, you know, could and I think be. one of the other things that a lot of people don't talk about is, you know, I love that. I think you have to have a passionate element in your business. You can always have that underlying like foundation. Mm -hmm. For me though, I get more passion working one-on-one with clients, but the business side, I know that I can only serve a finite number of clients. So I have passion with like my online courses and contract templates because I have the passion for helping other small business owners be legally protected, but it's different levels of passion. Like I get so much more passionate when I'm like one-on-one or when I'm at conferences teaching because, and that is kind of one of those, when we're looking at real biz, real life, how do we serve ourselves? How do we serve our family and how do we serve our community? And that there's all those little pieces. And for me, I actually almost feel like one-to-one service or like even at conference style, it probably serves me more than it does other people, but it fulfills that. And there was something that you brought up. And and in fact, I saw a video that you did on your own Instagram page and you were in the grocery store. And oh, I were... knew you were going to bring this one up. I almost said it earlier. Yeah. I love it. Actually. <laughs> I loved it because I was like, yes, yes, Rachel. Yes. No girl. That video is the worst. My hair is no. and I have worked <laughs> out. My mascara is like smudged because I just ran to the grocery store at like 10 o'clock at night. And I just did the video and now it's my most popular reel. I'm like, you know of what? course, why not? <laughs> <laughs> because you know why? Because you were real in that moment yeah. and none of us actually saw what you saw. That is the biggest thing. No one saw that you have been, you know, it was 10 o'clock or whatever, but you're standing in the bread aisle Mm -hmm. and you are talking about the fact that there are so many different bread companies. And can you elaborate a little bit about that? Because I think that's the other part of it. We've been talking about this all the time, do what serves you and how you're going to serve your community. But that moment watching you, I thought, hello, Hello, everyone. Can you see this, please? Because Mm -hmm. it's so important. I almost brought this up earlier when we were talking unique serving positions. So, you know, when you're looking around and seeing that there's hundreds of other people, maybe trying to make the same offering as you trying to meet the same need in the market. Just think about the bread aisle. You could take for any sort of food or even anything else. The bread aisle has hundreds of different types of bread. You got hundreds of different brands, but it's not stopping them from selling bread, right? Mm -hmm. Because when I go, I don't want sourdough or I want an artisan with olive oil or, you know what I mean? Like (laughs) there's, and so that's kind of a good way to shape and think of, okay, I may be selling business to business. Well, okay. So 5 million other people. Okay. Let's narrow that down. How can I serve more uniquely? All right. Mm -hmm. My bread's going to be going to have olive oil and a artisan crust with rosemary sprinkle. Like, you know, and I joke about it, but it is true in that there is a place in the market. The market's so huge, no matter what industry that you're in, some more than others, especially if you're a fitness person. Oh my gosh, that market is huge. There's room for everybody right. or in the health, health and fitness, but yeah, it just, oh my gosh, that video, I'm like, my face is red right now. because <laughs> I left it up because I'm like, oh, it's resonating, but oh, I hate how it looks. Oh. That's actually a good lesson. It's the imperfect action. And it's funny yeah. you brought that up because when Instagram first came out, I didn't have 
I was really, I had some team members, but I was pretty much doing everything. So I didn't have like a graphic designer. I didn't really understand visual presentation. I was just putting up if you scroll back to about probably 2014, 2015 on my Instagram, they're the worst pictures ever. They're the highest engagement ever. Right. And I don't think it's because necessarily just because the algorithm has changed. It's because it's authentic and raw and it's not right. polished. Yeah. And that's something that we all have to understand is that if you're looking at any of the content creators out there, mm -hmm. it isn't the perfection. And we have to let go of that idea. We're not going to get perfect results every time when we show up in business in our mm -hmm. life, in our mindset, in our growth. It is a messy, beautiful life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we have to allow it to be that way. Oh no, I was going to say, I feel like, and I'm not knocking influencers. I've kind of got like influencer style, but I think yeah. the whole like perfect influencer feed mm -hmm. that is intended to attract sponsors and brands right. has been like the messaging to those of us that are B2B or B2C, business consumer or business to business. And we're actually erroneously attaching something that isn't helpful to right. us, right? The, yeah. And I'm the same way. I've been like, oh, my feed's awful. It's got to be perfect. And actually has worked to a detriment because I haven't posted raw and real type stuff. So I think it's important if you're looking at other people, what is, what is behind why they're posting a perfect Instagram feed? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, brands want to see cohesion, like big brands, big corporations that are going to directly pay them. But do you, do I really care if I land on your podcast? Is, is, is your perfect feed going to make a break if I listen to your podcast? No. Right. Yeah. Exactly. In fact, I'm going to be more attracted to looking at videos of you in the bread aisle at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. You can say what you want, but I loved it because Thank it was you. like, yes, yes, yes. A hundred percent. Yes. I loved it. <laughs> well, uh, so don't be surprised now when all you see are videos of me in the grocery okay, store and they're kicking the bread me out because I'm doing reels in there. <laughs> Tomorrow it is orange juice, my friend. Tomorrow <laughs> it's orange juice. Oh, I love it. I could spend the next three hours talking about this with you. I want to just take a moment before we get into some of our final thoughts, but what do you feel is the key takeaway to any person that's listening that says, okay, Rachel, Danielle, I'm ready, ready. I'm ready to step into this place. I'm scared as hell, but I understand the formula. I'm going to get started. I'm going to put myself out there. What's the takeaway? I think it maybe goes back to the one thing of make a decision, right? This is not a life ending decision. Make a decision and make a plan and execute it. And yeah. it's an imperfect plan, execute it. You know, I, I see a lot of, I know, I love her. So even if she listens to this podcast, she agrees with what I'm about to say. I have a really good friend who is one of the most brilliant business people I know. And she's a wonderful person inside out as well. She has had roadblocks in business because she gets paralyzed by perfection. Mm -hmm. And so I think the biggest takeaway that I would encourage here is imperfect action is better than perfect procrastination. Ooh. Just get it out there. But if you sit on this idea for years, it's every day that you're not putting out content or making the offers every day, you're, fr you're not getting off the starting line. Right, you're stretching right. your legs, you're tying your shoes, you're taking water, but you're never crossing the starting line. So imperfect action beats perfect procrastination. That's the quote of the century. <laughs> it really is. It really is. I mean, really, truly think about that. You guys think about how many times we've stopped ourselves because we are not perfect. We're not ready. It's going to you know, be a hot mess. What if I can't, I shouldn't take that out of your vocabulary, get started. I love Agreed. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I end this podcast the same <laughs> always, <laughs> always, always, because it is often what people come back to and they'll write in about and say, you know, I loved their three to end it. And I've actually started doing that in my own life. So I ask you, what are your three? First one's going to be so cliche, but I do, I am so grateful for the fact that we get to do this. We don't mm -hmm. have to do it. And that's a big carryover from after having cancer that I get to create this and then it can have its own pressure, but I get to do it. I think that the second one is we've already said a little bit of that. All decisions I make, I am so filled with gratitude that they're just 
a decision. They're not the final decision that I have the freedom to change and grow, especially living in this country in this time period that as a woman, such great. And then I have the flexibility to now that I'm able to be fluid in my decision. So everything's a decision, not the decision. And, oh man, I think I'm just grateful for opportunities step further of that, that I'm able to choose my opportunity so that I'm able to really put, instead of being, you know, spread thin and doing all of them, I get to be very selective on like podcasts or conferences I go to so I can really pour in. Cause like I shared that fulfills me so much. I do think it makes a bigger impact for what I'm doing, which is one of my big three. So I'm so, I feel with gratitude that I'm a place in my life that I can, I can pick and choose so I can really fully serve. I love your three. If someone wanted to work with you, Rachel, how would they find you? Oh yeah. I am the only Rachel Brinky on the interwebs. So <laughs> you guys can hit up the website. I am frequently on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. So you can just reach out. I help to do all my own social. Cause again, one of my big things is being able to directly impact. So if you reach out more than likely you'll get a hold of me and you can see more grocery store reels on my Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can throw it out there that you don't want it, but I'm telling you it made a huge impact. <laughs> I love it. I think when we show up in moments that we don't expect for them to quote, go viral is when we are in our element to be our, really honest. I think that's really when we're at our best self. <laughs> <laughs> so I thank you. I am so thankful to you for giving us the time today to allow us to learn from you and to be able to you know, really set a fire into intention and choice. So thank you, Rachel. Of course. Thank you. One of the biggest takeaways, at least for me, is that we all have a passion. We all have a purpose and that the women we inspire to be isn't so much about our work ethic. It's about our impact. It's the way we serve ourselves, our lives, our families, communities, businesses, our fundamental purpose. Each of us has the power to move into action, create a legacy, and to do so imperfectly. Because as Rachel said, imperfect action is better than no action at all. So get started. Build your life through deep intention. Turn that whisper into full-blown greatness. If you would like to dive deeper and continue to learn from Rachel, you can follow her on social media at Rachel Branke or visit rachelbranke.com. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please don't forget to turn on notifications to be alerted each week when two new episodes of the Get Your Life Together Girl podcast is released. If you're looking for daily inspiration, join the growing community at Get Your Life Together Girl on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, or visit getyourlifetogethergirl.com. Thank you for listening and being a valuable part of this community. Until next time, be kind to yourself and others.